Today, we are delighted and I am excited to have with us Dr. Alice Green. She will briefly share her story, her life story, her involvement in the civil rights movement and the social justice movement. She is well known throughout the city of Albany and also the county of Albany and even the state. Dr. Green has earned three master's degrees and a PhD from SUNY Albany. She is a true SUNY Albany alumna. Those degrees include a BA in social science, an MA in secondary education of social sciences and English, and a master's of social work from the University of Albany at uh, SUNY Albany, and a master's in criminal justice. She later earned a PhD in criminal justice also from the University of Albany. She is what I call a lifelong learner. <clears throat> Dr. Green's education has been a tool to equip her to meet the needs of the community. She is well, as I stated before, she's well known in the state of New York as a community activist. She's received numerous awards, recognizing her commitment to civil rights and social justice, and she's been recognized by numerous people, such as Governor Mary Cuomo, First Lady, former First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. She is known for her as being the founder of the Center for Law and Justice, which was started in 1985. This center is a nonprofit organization that monitors criminal justice uh, activities, provides legal, uh, legal education, and criminal justice advocacy. She's not only the founder of the uh, Center for Law and Justice, but she's also the founder of the Alice Moore Black Cultural Center and also a writer's institute called the Payton Institute. There's so much to talk to, uh, to, 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 to uh, describe her. She's, a, she's authored several books. Her latest books are We Who Believe in Freedom and Outside Stories of Growing Up in the Adirondacks. So, as I said before, we're delighted to have her with us. And so we're going to begin with a few questions so she can tell us about herself. Dr. Green, could you tell us, um, I, how, did you, how did your family end up in the Adirondacks? Wow, that's a good one. Uh, I'm going to back up and, and let you know that uh, I'm one of the few people probably still living <laughs> uh, who actually had contact and uh, was related to someone who was formerly incarcerated. So uh, I was in the South. Um, my great grandmother was born in 1863 and she uh, stayed on at the plantation that her family was at. But I never forgot the fact that I saw her at a very young age, because she lived uh, to a very ripe old age. <laughs> but the fact that she was uh, owned by someone, that she was considered property, uh, that weighed very heavily upon me. And so I uh, you know, devoted my life to making sure that I'm as free as I can be. And that was the same thing that my father thought about as well. And so uh, my family was in the South, in Georgia, South Carolina, and um, it became very obvious that what was happening during uh, Jim Crow era and following, uh, of course, the, the Civil War, was that there was put into place a convict leasing system and under that system, uh, especially men, women were also taken advantage of, but men were um, leased out to businesses if they found themselves involved with the criminal justice system, whether they were arrested for uh, some small uh, offense or whatever it was, uh, and they couldn't pay the fine, uh, or if you were in jail for a period of time, you couldn't get out. So they developed this convict leasing system, which basically took the place of enslavement. Uh, the the uh, labor of these people were exploited, and so it looked a whole lot like enslavement. Yes. And so, uh, and Jim Crow was there, of course, with discrimination, which could criminalize black people for being black. Yes. And so I think his mother uh, was concerned about what was going to happen to her son because he was a little, little aggressive out there. 
uh, and her oldest son had already come north uh, because of the iron ore industry in the Adirondacks. So they used, they started using black people to work in those hot furnaces uh, after the federal government had uh, reduced the number of immigrants who could come to work in the, the iron ore industry in, in the Adirondacks. So uh, his brother went first and then he got uh, his younger brother, my father, to join him up in the Adirondacks. And there were a small group of people from the South who would come up to become employed and to escape Jim Crow. So that's how we ended up in a small town in the Adirondacks called Witherby, New York, where we were basically uh, one of two families. There was another family with one child, but my family included six, six uh, children and my parents. And so we're in a town that was basically white and was basically Catholic. So that made us outsiders. <laughs> we were neither. And uh, we were from Europe. We, uh, you know, we were immigrants, but we came with the, uh, the great black migration north. Okay. And so that's how we ended up there. So were you born in, in the Adirondacks or were you? No, when I was actually born uh, in South Carolina before we moved okay. up to the Adirondacks, because I spent all my life pretty much in the Adirondacks. I don't have any real ties to the, to the South. Okay, so I know, I remember meeting you once and you talked about an experience of being in the Adirondacks, you had a white friend and you decided to have a summer job. Could you tell us about that experience? Yeah, that, uh, again, I'm still always thinking about my great-grandmother. Yes. But uh, when I became of age, able to work, when you're 14 or 15, you get working papers. Uh, we were all still in poverty up in the Adirondacks. Uh, make no mistake about that. Uh, but my friend who was white, next door neighbor, and I decided we would work. My mother was very happy about that because uh, she needed help. Uh, my father had been injured and was not able to do the work that he did when we first uh, arrived there. And so we decided to get this job and, uh, in, a, in the tourist industry in, in the Adirondacks is very big. Uh, so we, we got, we were employed by uh, this white woman who was from Florida and she had a um, uh, motel and restaurant and each year she would come up with her uh, uh, two workers, a couple from the south and another, there was another uh, young black man. And so we were just delighted to have this, this job, our first job, our first time away from home. Uh, and we thought we would have great fun as well, living with each other, we had, you know. And so uh, when we got to our, uh, to the Claudus's uh, motel and, and restaurant, uh, the owner, Mrs. Claudus, uh, came to greet us. And she lived in a spacious apartment, you know, on the premises of this uh, business. Uh, so we talked to her and, and uh, told her, you know, how happy we were to have this job. So she said, well, I'm gonna show you where you're gonna be living. And she took my uh, uh, friend, my girlfriend, and showed her where her room was going to be, in with the family in this spacious, you know, uh, apartment. Uh, and uh, then she showed me where I was gonna work and took me outside of the building. And um, we were still saying, uh, we want to share a room together. We've been excited about doing that. She says, well, that can't happen. And I am kind of confused about that at first uh, until she took me outside to the back of the building. And there was an old barn there where they had kept uh, animals before. And they cleared away the top uh, part of the, bar of the uh, barn uh, for the black employees. So the, the couple that you brought from Florida, the other young man, uh, they worked at night, but they would, would uh, live in this particular uh, spot, this loft. Did you say barn. a barn? It's a barn. Oh. 
A B A R N. Wow. <laughs> Where they had, as I said, previously had animals. And so I'm with her alone. She's taking me up the stairs. And we get to the top of this barn. Um, and the only thing there that I could see was a cot. And she said, This is your room. And I said, Really? Uh, I was scared to death. I mean, I'm 15 years old. I was scared to death that I've been away from home. Um, and I knew something was wrong with that. Um, the other workers weren't there, and I went downstairs and I said, uh, I know you live up in that barn, <laughs> and I'm going to be living with you. I said, Aren't you concerned about that? And they said, That's the way it is. She accepted, she separated all of her white staff, put them in good housing, and she reserved the barn for workers, black workers. Um, and that night I was up there in that barn alone, uh, scared to death, <laughs> scared to death. Um, and I realized I'm I mean, I have a problem here, but uh, I did manage to get into bed, um, couldn't sleep, and uh, soon things start moving uh, up, up up near the roof, and I wasn't sure what it was, but it didn't take me long to figure it out, because <clears throat> they start flying around me. They were bats. I had never in my life encountered a bat, uh, and it scared me to death. I had heard about them, I had seen pictures of them. I was scared to death, and oh, I'm yeah. alone. Oh yeah. Away from home. Oh yeah. So I thought about that, you know, I couldn't sleep at night, I probably cried all night. <laughs> uh, and I said, this is not, this is not right. But then the picture of my mother came into my mind, Alice, you have to work this summer. And so I said, am I going to be able to do this? Um, then I, I made a decision. So the next day I went down and I asked to meet with the owner. And I asked her why did all the black people live in a barn and the white people lived in good housing. And she basically said the same thing. That's the way it is. Uh, and so I decided that I had to leave, that I couldn't stay there. I know my mother would be upset. Uh, luckily, my girlfriend came into the room and she heard what was going on. And uh, the owner says, well, if you're not happy with living there, uh, I'm gonna fire you. And I said, well, you can't fire me because I already quit. I had quit in my mind. <laughs> right. I knew that it was wrong. Uh, I was 40 miles from home, uh, had no telephone, wow. had no transportation. Wow. And then my girlfriend Myrtle said, well, if you're leaving, I'm leaving too. So we both quit and went and got our things and we hit the road. How did you get home? I walked. 40 miles? Yeah. Oh my I goodness. Walk. Because I, and, but it wasn't bad because I left with my dignity in yes. fact and my respect for myself and I knew I needed the money, but it was more important that I be able to uh, live with myself and not to allow people to enslave me the way that they have enslaved my great grandmother. So that has stayed with me. Yes. Uh, it's part of the work that I do. Uh, we who believe in freedom. Uh, I recorded that <laughs> because I, I want people to understand where I come from right. and how important it is to not be owned by anybody. Right. And people can own you in different ways. <clears throat> And we were, I, I'm from the South, I grew up in the South, so you never assumed that you would have such rigid segregation this far north, oh, uh, but you did. Yes. So my father learned that very early. I mean, he was escaping from the South uh, because of Jim Crow's segregation, but uh, the North was different, I admit that. 
it was uh, this, the racism and the segregation was more subtle, mm -hmm. but it was still there, mm -hmm. and you know, in micro kinds of ways, it was still there, and I experienced. So I grew up in an area, as I said, where I had to uh, learn who I was, and there was nobody to teach me, um, and uh, learn how to how to survive, basically, in a white world. Okay. Yeah. Were there any other incidents similar to that, like when going to school in Willoughby or any other incidents where you had to deal with racism or...? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, people live with these stereotypes and they make judgments about you based on stereotypes. And <clears throat> being in a, a community of white people, uh, all of them from different countries, mo mostly Europe, Poland, Italy, France, you know, uh, they were diverse in terms of their ethnicity, mm -hmm. but uh, a friend of mine that I grew up with reminded me that during that time, if you, uh, if someone different came into the community that wasn't uh, from any of those countries, <laughs> especially black people, that they were considered outsiders. It's like the title of my second book there. Yes. It's outsider. We were considered outsiders, and um, we had to live with the stereotypes of being black. And unfortunately, in school, there was no way for me to learn any of my history of who I was, because you know some of the teachers were great, but they didn't know who I was either. <laughs> and so um, we survived, but but not socially. I mean, we had friends. Um, but when it came to socializing, we were outside. My brother was uh, a great athlete, and that was a positive because uh, schools up in those in those small towns uh, glorify uh, athletes mm -hmm. and sports, and so they were able to survive very well uh, as long as they were doing sports. Yes. But he was so popular that they voted him. Uh, King of the Junior Prom. Wow. But no one would, he couldn't get a date. Wow. No one could go with him. Uh, and I also had to live with the stereotypes of being, people thought you were uh, <laughs> uh, ignorant and, mm -hmm. you know, without any kind of intelligence whatsoever. Uh, and again, I go back to my great grandmother. Yeah, she uh, was not allowed to learn how to read and write. Uh, my father was illiterate. Uh, he did not have the opportunity to read and write. So, but they did impress upon my, my uh, grandparents, did impress upon me and my mother that education was important. And uh, so I always believed that. And so I had to, had to almost fight for people to recognize that I did have some intelligence, you know. And I ended up uh, graduating at the top of my class. Wow, wow. Now, how were you, I know you said your parents were poor, uh, working class family, and I know we didn't, we don't, you didn't have all the benefits of going to uh, scholarships and all these other things that we can get to go to college now. How did you end up going to SUNY Albany? How yeah, I had, I, um, well, as I said, I graduated at the top of my class, so I got a small um, one-year uh, scholarship, a couple hundred dollars, or whatever. Uh, so there was that. My parents had absolutely nothing to give to me. Mm -hmm. And so when I first came to SUNY, um, what I had to do was to find a way to uh, live. <laughs> and luckily, I was able to find a family that allowed me to live with them and in, in exchange for work, you know, taking care of their children and that kind of stuff. So that I was able to do when I, when I first came. Um, and, um, and I did work other little jobs. And then there was a, a group of people at the, in the church that uh, I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I said there was only, everybody was Catholic, but there was one uh, Protestant church, a okay. Presbyterian church. Yeah. And there were some really nice people there. So when I got ready to go to college, I said, you belong, you belong in college. 
And so they gave me a small grant uh, that paid for, you know, for uh, school expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all put money together for, and this is only for a year. Then yes. after that, I had to, had to figure out myself how to, <laughs> how to do this with loans and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So I, you know, I, I survived, but it was, it was sometimes difficult. Yes. Yeah. But, and that's what I think the story, one of the wonderful stories for people, uh, to, for us to hear from people like you is despite the difficulties, the, the difficulties didn't hinder you from getting your education um, and from pursuing it. Even though you had to work and all this other stuff, you still felt compelled to get educated. And that's yeah. an amazing story. Right. So what got you involved in in, in the social justice civil rights movement? Because I, I, it seems like your grandmother has played a role because she was born into slavery. Your father who was born into the whole Jim Crow uh, uh, era uh, has played a role. Uh, but, but, and then you, there was this issue when you were a young person you trying to get a job at this camp, at this tourist location that didn't work out. What was, what was the thing that really propelled you to get involved in the civil rights movement? Well, one of the things I didn't learn very well was uh, discrimination <laughs> and uh, how people, uh, as I said, use stereotypes to make judgments about me. Mm -hmm. So I, I was quite aware of that. So when I started out as a teacher and I, and I, you know, I uh, worked in, a, I was discriminated against, first of all, from getting a job. I was going to stay in my hometown. With my with my parents, wow, and really, and, and, right? Yes, and, and help take care of them, right? So uh, there was a position open at the school, and uh, I got discriminated. They, they said, you know, you, <laughs> they gave this excuse that uh, you, uh, the student would be too familiar with you. I don't. That doesn't make any sense to me. But at any rate, that's that's the excuse that they gave me. So I did work. Uh, start out working in an urban community in Rochester. Oh, uh, it, it, with uh, in, in a very poor urban community, and so my students obviously uh, reflected that, that that environment. Uh, so I realized that I could identify with them, and but I wanted to know more about them. That it wasn't a matter of just being in the classroom. Because uh, they had lives outside of the classroom, yes. and so I got involved in their personal lives. I visited all my students' uh, families. Wow! And knew who they were. Wow! And so, uh, and understanding what was happening to them when they were in poverty. So, uh, you know, that really encouraged me to to do more in the area of the deal, helping people deal with poverty. Then I eventually uh, came to Albany again to. Uh, to work here, um, and my major job was at Trinity Institution. Uh, yes, I started out as a social worker, and again, putting me in contact with poor kids who are trying to survive like I did. <laughs> but I also noticed that uh, a lot of them came in contact with police, and uh, what the impact of that was on their lives, and. Uh, so I realized, that, you know, that uh, uh, there was a different treatment of people uh, in in the community in, in many different ways. But I was particularly interested in the policing part, and so I wanted to know more about um, uh, how to work as a social worker because that's the work I was doing. So I went back and got an uh, MSW to learn more about social work so I could be a good worker. <laughs> and getting it, and allowed, that job allowed me to get involved in community organizing work. Yes. And um, uh, challenging the uh, political structure in the city of Albany, uh, which was very controlling. Uh, it was a, a machine, it was a democratic yes. machine that controlled everything. Who got jobs? Who got housing and where? And uh, the amazing employment, all that was controlled. Uh, the civil rights movement was, you know, had been going on. And, uh, so uh, I, I did a lot of community organizing, making sure that people were given the rights that were they were uh, uh, entitled to. 
you know, whether it's voting uh, or just general civil rights. Yes, Miss Miss Ann Polk spoke about how the police were very discriminatory when she was uh, in her younger years mm -hmm. toward African Americans, in particular African American men. Was that something that you had witnessed here? Or? Oh, that was the first thing, man. Uh, that the uh, the political machine had uh, identified certain people on the force to be controllers. That's the first thing I learned <laughs> when I came to the And uh, it was true. Uh, they controlled where you could go, pretty much. They uh, controlled, um, you know, whether you could vote or not. I mean, I started getting involved in and poll, poll watching kind of thing. And I had to put police officers out of the building because they're leaning on the, on the voting machines. And they also had the $5 vote. They paid people to vote for uh, certain people. Um, so it, it was all there. Uh, uh, police officers, very controlling and abusive. So you didn't have to go very far to, to see what was happening. And I just found that, you know, again, so controlling and uh, that feeling of being owned in the sense <laughs> that you're going to exploit me. Um, so, yeah, we had to do a lot of community organizing. Wow. Um, and then, as I said, because I was aware of the policing and, the, and what the role of the criminal justice system, um, our, our folks here in Albany, I decided again to study more about it, so I want to know exactly what it is. And so uh, I did go back and get another uh, a master's in criminology. So, and that put me involved, in a, uh, to get involved in a lot of the policing stuff, the criminal justice stuff, and eventually incarceration, which is where I spent a lot of my time because I was very uh, concerned that black people were um, disproportionately arrested and incarcerated, which has a, a, a damaging impact on the lives of not only their families, but our communities. And so that's how I, you know, got involved in, you know, trying to uh, establish a review board uh, uh, and, and, and dealing with uh, uh, trying to, to uh, discourage police from brutalizing people, all of those things that I got involved in. And um, pretty soon I decided that I also need to be involved in, uh, in prison work. So I got involved in that because a lot of our young people were coming back from prison. Uh, not only were they being put in, but coming back from prison and having uh, certain needs. I mean, when, you, when you're incarcerated in uh, this society here, uh, it's almost permanent. Mm -hmm. You know, even though you might have a prison sentence, when you get out, if you can't live in housing, if you can't find employment because you have a uh, conviction record, mm -hmm. or you can't take advantage of educational grants because of your, your status as a formerly incarcerated person, that you couldn't vote um, while you're in prison and only recently can you vote while you're on parole. <laughs> so uh, that, I knew that's where I wanted to, um, you know, put most of my energy into dealing with uh, the criminal justice system for, uh, and, and, and running into and learning from incarcerated people. That's where I got my education. I mean, I had the degrees, but they didn't mean a thing. <laughs> It was when I started working uh, in the prisons with uh, incarcerated people that I really understood, that I learned the, uh, what the role of the criminal justice system was in the lives of black people. And so that's what I've been doing. That's why I started the Center for Law and Justice uh, in 1985 uh, to monitor policing to uh, work to make changes in the criminal justice system uh, and to help people who are threatened with 
with uh, incarceration and also work with those who come back into the community. But basically trying to change the system mm -hmm. as much as I possibly could as, you know. Can you think of anything um, related to your work in reforming the criminal justice center, uh, system um, or even the social activism that has brought you the most joy? Um, <laughs> most joy. Um, I think my work with incarcerated people, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, I um, did a lot of work with a lot of people who were there for a long period of time, but they were so incredibly uh, intelligent and committed to uh, making changes in a system that had damaged them. Wow. And they were afraid that, uh, uh, you know, that if they didn't do something to make changes, that all the young people out there would uh, be harmed in the same kind of way. So I think uh, developing those relationships and learning from them was certainly uh, one of the greatest things I think that happened to me in my life. Wow. It came from those people who had been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I, as, I stayed involved and in going into the prisons of, for a long period of time until I was uh, banned uh, from the prison because of the work that I was doing. Uh, but that brings me great joy and to work with young people. You know, we've been teaching young people what their legal rights are, uh, and fearing that if the wrong moves were made out in the community, that our, we would lose our kids. Yes. And so, um, just being with them and and trying to open their eyes and uh, to understand uh, what's out there yes. <laughs> and how they have to protect themselves. But those are that that brings me a great you know deal of uh, joy. And uh, we've had some successes, you know, with uh, police. We're the ones who who introduced the. the uh, Albany Police Department to the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, which diverts people from uh, arrest and, and, and jail. Wonderful. And so we got that going, and we also introduced the concept of community policing um, and working with the department to try to, you know, deal with some, some of the problems that we both saw. So, but I think those, those things brought me Great joy, great. yeah, and people, just people, you know, <laughs> you know, walking down the street, and somebody saying, "Oh, thank you, uh, you helped me with my son." Wonderful. Uh, and you know, to me, that's more important than somebody giving me an award, because <laughs> <laughs> it is an award. It is, in many respects, an award. Yes. And I, yes. I get that all the time. So, and just the joy of knowing that we built trust. Uh, in the community, people come to us because they trust us. Mm -hmm. They don't trust a lot of the institutions that deal with them. Yes. And um, but they do trust us. Great. So when there's a tragedy or crisis, what you know, uh, we get it. <laughs> yeah. You know. But I'm happy that we have a place where people feel that they can come when nobody else will uh, listen to them or help them. We can't we can't solve all the problems. I'm yes. not suggesting yes. that. Yes. But people trust us. Yes. And that trust is worth. Yes. You know, it's platinum. <laughs> if this is just the closing remarks, if you had any words of wisdom you want to give young people, what would be those words of wisdom? Well, um, <laughs> in the book, I talk about a number of things, and I always go back to. Uh, not allowing people to exploit you, to own you in a certain kind of ways. To feel, you know, to value the lives of everyone. Every, every life is important. So, uh, you know, learn how to do that, but uh, also do good work. I mean, everybody has to work and make a living. I understand that, and that's not what I mean by not being owned. 
but you can work in a, in a job that you know might be uh, destroying other people. Maybe it's not a good place to be. You know, do your work, but don't allow people to own you. And that's always circling around in my head. <laughs> that freedom is more important than anything, and it takes a long time to, to get to that point. Long time. So you gotta be prepared to work uh, to achieve it. And who knows when it'll come, but we have to do something. Thank you, Dr. Alice Ray, on behalf of the, uh, all, uh, the Council of Churches and Martin Luther King Interfaith Scholarship Program Committee. We want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to let us hear your life story. It is a truly inspirational. Thank you. Well, thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>